Well, over the last few weeks, we have been looking together at Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's chapters 5, 6, and 7. We're still in chapter 5, uh, in verse 33 is where we're looking today. We're in the middle of a section where Jesus is revealing the true meaning behind various parts of the Old Testament law. Remember that Jesus said in verse 17 that he did not come uh, to destroy the law or the prophets. He came to fulfill. He taught that his disciples must be characterized by, uh, by a righteousness that exceeds even the righteousness of the most religious people of his day, the scribes and Pharisees as he said in verse 20. And then Jesus gives us six examples of this, uh, how our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. He gives six examples in uh, verses 21 through 48. Now in each of these cases, he shows us that uh, what that surpassing righteousness looks like by contrasting the superficial obedience of the scribes and Pharisees with the genuine obedience to the true spirit of the law that God intended. Jesus isn't interested in his disciples having a superficial, outwardly religious conformity to God's law. Instead, he desires that from the heart we understand the true spirit of what God wants from us in his commandments and that having grasped that true spirit of the law, we then would seek to obey his commandments with all of our heart. And so this morning we continue our study of Jesus' instruction on the, on the law of God by looking here at verses 33 through 37. In this section, Jesus is talking about the importance of honesty and integrity in all that we say and do. Jesus is particularly talking about the taking of oaths in this passage. But his words really also apply to uh, all of the promises and vows and words that we would use. They are, all of these things are similar. A vow is a solemn promise or a pledge before God or before men. Uh, we think about our wedding vows that we take uh, a husband to his wife and a wife to her husband. Uh, we make these vows to each other in the presence of other witnesses, in uh, the presence of God. And, and so we think of vows oftentimes in that way. Um, an oath, specifically in the context of uh, the Bible, and an oath means bringing God into the equation. When you take an oath, you are calling on God to be your witness that you are telling the truth and that and you're calling on God as your judge should you be lying or if you should break your word and at the heart of this subject that Jesus is dealing with here is the conviction that God is true God truly is God and he takes very seriously the things that we say and that we are accountable to God for what we say. As his followers, Jesus is calling us to be here to be people of the truth. People who say what we mean and mean what we say. God himself is a God of absolute, unfailing truth. He speaks of things, when God speaks, 
He speaks as things really are. He keeps every promise that he makes and he fulfills every word that he utters. He does exactly what he says he will do and he always keeps his promises. Numbers 23, 19 contrasts God and the way that he deals and, and speaks with humans in the way that we deal and speak. In Numbers 23, 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will not do, or has he spoken and will he not make it good? You see, that verse not only condemns us for our untruthfulness, but it also shows the, the truthfulness and the faithfulness of God in contrast to us. God is not a man. How do we know? He doesn't lie. All men are liars. God is not that. What he says, he will do. What he speaks, he will make it good. Psalm 117, as we read this morning, praises God for his merciful kindness is great towards us and the truth of the Lord endures forever. God's truth is eternal because God is eternal. When God promises something, he bases that promise on himself because there is no one higher than himself and there is no one more true than God is. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, he says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. He says two things confirm our salvation for us. One, God has pledged himself with an oath. He swore on himself since there was no one greater than himself, he says. And two, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. He is the God of truth. Jesus said of himself, he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. This is what God is like. And Jesus says we are to be like him. We are to be like our heavenly father. In fact, if you go down to verse 48, you'll see he says it this way. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Think about that. What would it be like if everyone were to keep their word the way God keeps his word? What if people never lied? If everyone, what if everyone suddenly kept the vows that they make on their wedding day? What would lawyers do? There would be no reason for them, right? If everybody always told the truth, if everyone was always honest. How many corporate scandals would there be? How many people would even be able to run as politicians if they couldn't lie? Essentially, the first sin that happened on earth was a lie. Satan deceived Adam and Eve, especially Eve, as it shows in Genesis chapter 3, and, and, and that, that plunged the world into sin and destruction. Him saying, did God really say, calling into doubt, the very veracity of God's word. And then saying, no, you will not surely die. 
the devil said to her. And ever since that point, when humans took the lie of the devil and didn't believe the truth of God, lying is what people do. In Romans 13, uh, chapter 3, verse 13, Paul describes the effects of sin on humanity and he says it this way, their throat is an open tomb. There's dead things coming out of there, you see. He says, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. They just lie with their tongues all the time, he says. The poison of asps is under their lips. He says, what they speak is just deadly. Jesus' disciples, he says, those who are in the kingdom of heaven, we are to be different. We are to be people of the truth. And so I'm just going to have three points here today. The first one that we look at in verse 33 as we look at this passage is we'll see the Old Testament teaching on oaths. Jesus began by saying, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old. And here he's making reference to what the Jewish people had been taught concerning the law of Moses through their teachers. Not only what the scripture said, but what they were taught about what the scripture said. It follows the same pattern that Jesus had used back up in verse 21 and in uh, verse 27, uh, you have heard that it was said by those of old, but I say to you. He's giving this contrast of what they'd been taught and what he is uh, pointing out to them is the real uh, meaning of the law of God. So what does the Old Testament teach about oaths and honesty? Well, let's begin with thinking about uh, the commandments of God. Uh, in the Ten Commandments, two of them deal, I think, with this issue. The first is the third commandment, which says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In other words, we must not use God's name in a false way or in a way that empties uh, his name of its meaning. And so to give a false oath or to swear falsely, to say something and to make an oath and not perform it, would then be taking the name of the Lord in vain because you were being false uh, towards God. And the uh, ninth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 16, was what? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. They must not lie or perjure themselves in court. They were, they were also, according to Leviticus chapter 19, they were taught to honor the vows that were made in God's name. Leviticus 19, 11 and 12 says, You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another, and you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. It is to profane the name of the Lord to swear falsely, to swear to something and not do it. Uh, to go back on your word, to lie to one another. These are ways that they would profane the name of the Lord. Numbers chapter 30 verse 2 says, If a man or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And so Jesus sums up all of these teachings of the Old Testament regarding uh, these things. And he says it this way, verse 33, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. 
And the common denominator in all of this is what? The name of God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall uh, not uh, swear falsely or profane the name of the Lord. If you uh, make a vow to the Lord, you shall keep that which proceeds out of your mouth. And so the Jewish people took God's name seriously. And so the Old Testament says that we must not make any oaths in God's name that are not true or that we do not keep. That's the teaching of the Old Testament. But the scribes and the Pharisees were not satisfied with that. And so we see point number two, the loopholes and the manipulation of oaths that they would do. There, there was nothing wrong with the Old Testament law. Remember, Jesus upheld the Old Testament law. He did not come to abolish or destroy or to change the Old Testament law, but to fulfill it. The problem was that just as they had done with murder, just as they had done with adultery, the Pharisees were reinterpreting the law of God, the commandments of God, in order to find a way for them to keep it. We all know that we are sinners and unable to keep the law of God. And so the, I, what the Pharisees and the scribes did was they, they reinterpreted God's law to a point where they could keep the traditions that they had made about the law. The problem wasn't with the Old Testament commands, but with the Pharisees' legal loopholes and the manipulation of oaths that they did in order to get away with deception. What the teachers of the law had done was to shift people's attention away from the need to keep an oath or a vow to the formula that they used in making the vow. They argued that what the law was really prohibiting was, the take, was not the taking of the name of the Lord in vain, but the taking of the name of the Lord in vain. In other words, false swearing, they concluded, meant a profane use of the divine name, not perjury. That is a dishonest pledging of your word. So they developed this elaborate set of rules about the taking of oaths and vows. So that they listed which uh, formulas that you could use in a, uh, in a vow or in an oath. And they, and, um, and they added that it was, it was only sinful to break an oath whose formula included the divine name. So if you swore by anything else that, and you broke that, that vow or that oath, well, then that wasn't sinful. It was only sinful if you used the name of the Lord. So you didn't need to be so particular, they said, about keeping the vows in which you didn't invoke the name of God. And it eventually came to be that, that vows would be taken that were not in God's name, but they were close to it. <laughs> they were vows that were not, they didn't really sincerely mean, they didn't feel like they had to keep, or it wouldn't be a sin, certainly, if they didn't keep it, because... And oftentimes they had no real intention of keeping them. There was what William Barclay called frivolous swearing. Now, when he says swearing, he's not talking about using curse words. 
What he's talking about there, swearing, is the making of an oath. I swear that I will do this. Okay? It's the taking of an oath before God. And so there was what Barclay calls frivolous swearing, that is the, the taking of an oath when no oath was really needed or, or proper. They would say things like, by the life of my head, or maybe I, may I be struck dead if... And then, and people were just saying this all the time for no good reason. And then there was something even worse, something that Barclay called uh, evasive swearing. That is swearing by an oath that was so worded to avoid the name of God. If God wasn't involved, well, then the vow even if I didn't keep it, it wasn't that big a deal. So they made what they call, I, I, I would call, one step removed vows. They would make vows calling on, on things of God, but not calling on the name of God. They thought that they would avoid sinning because I even if they broke it, because uh, they weren't using the name of God. So Jesus, Jesus spoke about such vows in uh, chapter 23 when he was speaking the woes against the scribes and Pharisees. If you look at chapter 23, verses 16 through 22, Jesus said this, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for what is greater, the gold of the temple that, or, or the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift on, or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore, who, who swears by the altar, swears by it and by all things on it. He swears by the temple, swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. And that's exactly what Jesus is referring to in verses 34 through 36 when he says, But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. See, they were attempting to to take oaths and to swear to God one step removed. They were swearing by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or even by the life of my own head. They thought that such oaths were useful because they added credibility uh, to their uh, otherwise deceitful speech and they also had the added benefit of being less binding and they thought not sinful if they were to break them. So they had taken the Old Testament allowances about swearing by God and, he, and they had twisted them. When Leviticus 19.12 said not to swear falsely by the Lord's name, they took that to mean that they could swear falsely by something other than the Lord's name. When Numbers 32 said that if someone makes an oath to God, they must keep it, well, they took that to mean that they could renege on the oaths that were not made in the name of God. They could leave themselves an out. And so people were manipulating the truth with these loopholes. And what Jesus is teaching is that you can't get away from your accountability to God. God hears all of our words. He sees our hearts. He knows what our intentions are. If he has, if he has promised to hold us accountable for every idle word that we speak, <laughs> 
then there is no sacred or secular distinction in our words. There are not some oaths that are binding and others that are not binding. All of our promises are as binding as if we invoked the name of God in all of them. Because they're always spoken in the hearing of God. The Apostle James seems to take Jesus' words and uh, he paraphrases them here in James uh, 5 verse 12. He says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. And then after quoting Jesus, he says, lest you fall into judgment. Well, what did Jesus teach? This was the teaching of the Old Testament and the twisting of the truth by the scribes and Pharisees. What did Jesus teach? That's point number three. You see that in verses 34 and 37. Jesus says, but I say to you, do not swear at all. Now, some have taken Jesus' words here to mean that as his followers, we should never, under any circumstances, take an oath, make a vow. Some traditions of, of uh, Christianity have believed this. Uh, among them, for example, are the Quakers, who will not even swear an oath in a court of law. Um, there are many fine Bible teachers who teach that that's exactly what Jesus is teaching here in this passage and what James uh, teaches in James chapter 5. Um, Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher, was among them. He said, whether in court of law or out of it, the rule is swear not at all. Not at all. Those who hold this argument often look at Jesus' own trial as an example. They say that, you know, Jesus himself was compelled to testify in a court of law, and yet he seemed to uh, refuse to speak. The high priest urged him to answer the charges placed against him, saying, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And yet Jesus answered, it is as you said. Which is almost like saying, you've spoken the word yourself. <laughs> Personally, I don't think this was an example of Jesus refusing to take an oath. I believe he was simply recognizing that he was standing before a hostile court that had already predetermined uh, their verdict that they would execute him. And it didn't really matter what he said. He answered affirmatively, though, after being put under oath. On the other side of the argument, there are many occasions in which... Uh, the Apostle Paul himself uh, clearly made use of oaths in Scripture as he was writing uh, several of his epistles. Uh, he would say things like uh, in Romans 9, he says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for I could wish myself accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh who are Israelites. Uh, sounds like an oath almost, doesn't it? Uh, he told the Galatians, Now concerning the things which I write to you indeed before God, I do not lie. He said uh, to the Corinthians, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Uh, he says to Timothy, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. 
the writer of Hebrews points out that God himself used an oath in confirming his promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 6.13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. So is it always uh, wrong to make an oath? Or do we take the words of Jesus uh, at their face value here and say when he says, but I say to you, uh, do not swear at all. Well, I conclude that when Jesus said, do not swear at all, he was referring to the, the, the kind of so-called oath-taking that was promoted by the scribes and Pharisees where they, they intended to, to secure acceptance for what they said without putting them at risk of taking the Lord's name in vain. In other words, if your appeal to something other than God or even to God himself... If, if your appeal in an oath is for the express purpose of escaping the force and sanction of the truth, then you must not swear at all. That sort of swearing is what Jesus condemns here and in the rest of the New Testament. Jesus said we are not to swear by heaven, for it is God's throne. Nor we swear by the earth, for it is God's footstool. Yeah, Isaiah 66, 1 says this, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. In a similar way to Jesus' words in Matthew 23 that we read a moment ago, if we swear by the throne of God, we swear by God who sits on the throne, Right? If we swear by his footstool, we swear by the God who puts his feet on it. And those one step removed oaths don't get us off the hook. We, every time we speak, we speak in the presence of God. Nor will it help if we swear by Jerusalem. There was an old rabbinical teaching that, that stated that it was binding to take an oath toward Jerusalem, but not binding to take an oath by Jerusalem. That's how silly their rules got. But that kind of hair splitting won't work, Jesus says. In Psalm 48, verse 2, Jerusalem is the city of the great king. It is the place on this earth in which our Savior died. It's the place from which we're promised He will reign. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. And so if we swear by Jerusalem, we swear by the King who reigns there. And even swearing Jesus says by our own head will not get us off the hook. Because God has a th more authority over our heads than we do. He, sa he says, you can't even turn one hair black or white, at least not permanently. Right? Only God has the authority to over your head. He's the one that makes you age. There's no reversing it. God commanded his people that when they swear an oath, they were to swear only by his name. Why? Because he alone is God. And if they swore even by anything else that God had made, they were invoking God. He says, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve
to him. You shall hold fast and take your oaths in his name. Taking oaths, this one step removed from his name was an act of disobedience that was simply designed to cover up dishonesty. And the scribes and Pharisees were approaching this whole matter from the standpoint of the strictest letter of the law. Well, if you just don't use the name of the Lord, you're okay. Their main concern was, what's the bare minimum requirement with respect to oaths? Which oaths actually bind me to keeping them and which ones don't? That's what they were thinking about. Which ones are giving me some wiggle room so I can get out of my promises? But Jesus is calling his followers to be true keepers of the spirit of the commandments of God. He is, call, he is concerned to call us to a life of honesty and a life of promise keeping. And so... Really, avoiding oaths is inadequate itself. If we simply avoid swearing to anything, if we simply avoid taking oaths of any kind, we're still not fulfilling the spirit of the law that Jesus said. Avoiding oaths is inadequate. The issue is telling the truth. Right? Right? Because God witnesses every word that we speak. Jesus got right to the heart of the matter. He said in verse 37, But let your yes be yes and your no, no. In other words, he calls us as his followers to say what we mean and mean what we say. He calls us to be people of our word, people who keep the promises that we make, who stand faithfully by our own word. We're to be like the people described in Psalm 15. It says, who, Lord, who may abide in your presence, in your tabernacle, who may dwell on your holy hill, he who walks uprightly, who works righteousness, who speaks the truth in his heart. And then among other things mentioned in that psalm is that the true person is he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. We're to, to have such a reputation for being truthful people that when we say yes, people know we mean yes. When we say no, people know. We mean no. It's, it's like Jesus is saying, whatever comes out of your mouth, let it be truthful. Don't hide behind even culturally acceptable ways of shading the truth. That's what the Pharisees were doing. We have our own culturally acceptable ways of shading the truth, telling little white lies. But as followers of God, we're to step out and be different from the culture. We are to be men and women of integrity who speak the truth to one another in love. Everything that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount haven't we seen that it comes back to the reality that God sees into the very depth of our being? God sees our hearts. He sees the malice and murder in our hearts when we're angry with our brother or sister. He sees the adultery in our hearts as we gaze at... A woman, as Jesus said, he sees the adultery in our hearts as we divorce our spouse. And here he is the only lie detector with 100% accuracy. 
The righteousness that comes from God cares infinitely more about what God sees than what man sees. About what God hears from our lips than what people hear from our lips. For Jesus closes by saying, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. We said that that first sin here on this earth was by the liar. Jesus calls the father of lies the devil. And when we lie, when we don't keep our word, when we're not truthful, when we're not honest, then we're acting more like the devil is our father then God is our Father. God our Father is a God of truth. He keeps all of His promises. I want to become more like Him. If if we truly are people who know the Lord, who love Him, His truth will live in us. And from truthful hearts will come truthful speech. We cannot. If this, if this sermon has hit you right where you live and you know that it's condemned you as a liar, Know that you're not alone. As we saw in Romans 3, it's the human condition. That we all have deceit on our tongues. And that deceit comes straight out of our hearts. In the book of Revelation, both in chapter 21 and in chapter 22, says that all liars have a place in the lake of fire, which is the second death. So just like with murder, just like with adultery, as Jesus has already talked about, all of us are condemned as sinners, those worthy of hell. What do we do? We must have the righteousness of God if we're not to be condemned with the unrighteous. We can't can't have that righteousness on our own. Because we're all liars. So what do we do? This whole point of this sermon, I think, as you go through chapters 5, 6, and 7, the whole point of all of it is that we would throw ourselves on the mercy of God through Jesus Christ so that He would save us and give us His righteousness rather than our own. We cannot have the righteousness that makes us acceptable before God. We cannot be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect without the power of God to do it in us. And we have that when we believe on Jesus. When we trust in Him as our Lord and Savior, when we we turn from our our sin and ourselves and our own self-righteousness and we know that we are sinners, we are liars, and we go to the truth who is Jesus Christ Himself, the way, the truth, and the life, the one by whom no one comes to the Father except through Him. And we go to Him because He suffered and died for our sins. And because of his death on the cross, we can be forgiven and we can have the gift of eternal life. We can have the righteousness of God imputed to our account. He gives us the righteousness of God to to be in us so that we become people who live this way. We don't do it perfectly, not yet. 
We will be perfected someday when we are glorified together with Him. But increasingly, more and more, we will have that heart's desire to be a truthful people. Because Christ, the truth, and His Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, dwells within us. And so I invite you to come to Jesus and I invite you as believers in Christ to throw yourself upon Him and the Holy Spirit who loves you and be truthful people by the grace of God. Let's stand together as we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your message to us today. Lord, we need Jesus. We need the forgiveness of sins that He purchased for us on the cross. We need the gift of eternal life that only He can give. Oh, Father, look deeply into our hearts. Let us be open and honest before you, for you know all things. Father, I pray that every person here will have trusted in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for the forgiveness of their sins, and that your Holy Spirit will have come to dwell within them, the Spirit of truth, and that we as believers in Christ would be truthful people. just as you are true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.